Sasha here with former major leaguer Butch Hobson. Thanks for joining me, Butch. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Now, you played on some great Red Sox teams with some Hall of Famers, some legendary baseball men like Carlton Fisk, the Spaceman, Bill Lee. Um, Don Zimmerman. Don Zimmer was your manager at one point. What was it like playing for him? I mean, he needs you a full-time player. In well, sense. I mean, playing for Zim. Zim was a Zim was a player's manager, and he, you know, he loved his players. Um, uh, God rest his soul. He didn't really like pitchers too much, <laughs> and I think that was some of the some of the negativity he got from a lot of pitchers that pitched for him. Um, you know. Bill being kind of one of those guys, they just didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. Um, but as far as um, the man he was, he was baseball through and through. And I really liked playing for Don Zimmer. He was he was a hard nosed guy. He was an old school guy, uh, which I think that's the way it should be today anyway. But uh, things change. Um, yeah. But playing for Zim was a pretty special thing. Yeah. I bet it was. Um, did you realize what you were in the midst of playing with these guys, like? Or did it just kind of, you didn't even take time to, to think about it? Like these great guys like Carlton Fisk? And well, you know what, when you when you get to the big leagues for the first time, you're pretty much in awe of everything around you. you right. Know, when you walk into Fenway Park, it's a pretty special feeling. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I was a September call-up in 75, the year that they won the American League um, pennant and played the they say one of the best World Series ever against the Reds in 75. And of course, I wasn't, I was just a September call up and wasn't available. They didn't have it to where you could be available and picked off the 40 man roster to okay. be a part. Um, but it was, a, you know, I was in double A and I had a really good year. I was called up uh, in September. And at that point in time, got to um, be around at Skrimsky. Right. That must have been special. Yeah, and Carlton Fisk and, of course, Jimmy Rice and Fred Lynn were were rookies that year mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and played with the great players that I got to for a month. And then in 76, when Zimmer, uh, they, I was called up for two weeks. Rico had an ear infection. I was called up for two weeks. And I did okay for two weeks. But then um, we, Rico got well and Daryl Johnson was the manager. He sent me back to AAA. And then they fired Daryl two weeks later and took hired Zimmer, and the first thing Zimmer did was bring me up. That's right. And, um, and he gave you a pretty good chance. So at that point in time, you know, you're still a rookie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having the opportunity to play with Yabs and Fisk um, and Lynn and Evans and Rice and special Rick Burleson and George Scott. And, I mean, it's, and, you know, in the pitching staff with Louis Tiant and Billy and, Reggie Cleveland and uh, Sue Campbell was, was the closer on that team. It was uh, it was a pretty special. I would uh, think so. Definitely. Yeah. Talk about the 1978 AL East tiebreaker. I mean, you were the DH. Bucky Dent hit you know what proved to be the game winning three run home run mm. shot. What was that game like? Well, they call that the Bucky Dent game, but really it was the home run that, that Reggie had that really put the icing <laughs> on the cake for the Yankees. Um, you know, I had a really tough year with my elbow mm -hmm. uh, after the All-Star break. Um, so it was, was delegated at that point in time to, you know, DHing uh, some. Gotcha. And um, That's why you were the DH. Um, I DHed in that, in that game, yeah. yes. Um, I mean, I'll never forget it was both teams won 100 games. Yeah. Um, it was a day game in Boston in Fenway. Um, very exciting, really a lot of excitement around, and uh, you know the two people forget the two plays that Lou Pinetto made on balls that he lost in the sun, and miraculously the balls went in his glove, and those <laughs> balls get by, then the score might have been different. Yeah, and it was a, it was a uh, at, you know having the year that we had because we had a 13 game lead at the All Star break, and the people don't realize the Yankees played like 750 ball. Wow. And we had to win 18 out of our last 19, I think, something like that. That's just a lot of just to tie, just to, to tie. Yeah. And um, but it was, you know, the Yankee Red Sox rivalry was very intense. I was just going to ask you. I mean, you were your time with the Red Sox included one of the most heralded rivalries with the Yankees. I mean, what what was that like? You know, the Fisk Munson well, rivalry was it, very well documented. It, it it was a very intense rival when I managed Boston in '92, '93, and '94. It was the rivalry wasn't as intense. No. I don't know why. It oh. came back when the wild card came in, and the Red Sox Yankees, 
you know, had a lot of battles there for, for the for the team to win, you know, one of one team being the wild card. Uh, and I don't remember what years that were. I know um, it was around the 2003, 4, 5, 6 eras, and even today, it's still a big rivalry. But for some reason, I think our the intense, our, our most intense rival was probably the Blue Jays. Yeah. As a manager, I mean, it seemed like a Yankee Red Sox series every time we played the Blue Jays. It wasn't the same when we played the Yankees as it was when I played. Yeah. I think my coaches and myself were more intense. In that think, rivalry than the players. What well, were you? Um, were you more motivated, like, to play? You know, against against the Yankees uh, when you were with. When I was a player, yeah. I think so. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was. You know, it was the big Carlton Fist, Thurman exactly. Munson rivalry, and and then you know after the big brawl in '76, which I wasn't a part of because I didn't sit down with with. Uh, with uh, Greg Nettles and Philly mm -hmm. and that big, big, that big brawl that they had, it, it, it was pretty much escalated through the 70s and early 80s. Wow. Um, but, you know, going into Yankee Stadium was, I remember getting off the bus and, you know, today's world, they, they, the barricades were really wide. Back then they were only about wide enough for you to walk through so they could reach out and touch you if they wanted to. Wow. And it was pretty intimidating for us going to Yankee Stadium as it was for the Yankees coming to Fenway. <laughs> I remember we got on the bus after a game and uh, there were probably 4,000 people out there and they started rocking our bus and almost like the bus was coming up off its really? wheels. It was, it was pretty intense. There's a lot, I'm sure that a lot of Red Sox and a lot of Yankee players can tell you all about in those oh. days about a lot of really good stories. Mm -hmm. Now you managed the Red Sox from 92 to 94, right? Um, and that team was, would you call it a 500 team? Right? Well, my first year in 92, Mrs. Yawkey passed away before spring training. Roger was late for spring training because he's been given permission to do that. Um, Carlos Cantana was in a car wreck in Dominican. He hit 30 home runs and drove in like 103 the year before. He never played again. Uh, Jack Clark hit 30 plus and drove in 191 and went through bankruptcy and said he didn't know how much he was going to be able to help the team. Mike Greenwell blew his shoulder out uh, early June. Ellis Burke's back went out in Comiskey Park against the White Sox. He didn't play again that year. Um, Roger didn't have his best year. Wade Boggs hit the lowest he ever hit, which was like 262. Wow. He needed glasses and he didn't need glasses. And um, <laughs> he was really was trying to play out his option, you know, to his free agent. He's going to be a free agent after the season. So it was a very tough year as a manager for me, yes. And because Nin of that, well, sorry. Go ahead. Um, 93, 93, um, we, um, we, we finished 80 and 82 which I thought at one point in time, you know, a month after the All-Star break, that we looked like we might be a team that might make the playoffs. 94 was, um, you know, we had a lot of young players in Mo and Valentin and Timmy Naring and Aaron Seeley and Scott Cooper. Um, we were not very close to the Yankees at that point in time, but the, game, the, the season was, hot, was stopped with 40-something games left. Huh. A lot of things could happen in 40-something games, not that, that, that I see that it would have because we weren't that good. Right. Um, and then, you know, at, after that season, uh, Duquette had come in in 94 and uh, made some changes, and me not being rehired was one of those changes, and that's baseball. So would you say that it was due to the team performance that you were not hired again, or do you think that it had to do anything with um, your substance abuse? Well, I think it, 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 when you manage in the big leagues, you gotta win. Mm -hmm. And if you don't right. win, you ain't gonna have a job. Right. That's just the way it is. Um, I was given an extension for 94, uh, and during the 93 season, um, you know, many people felt that I was not ready. I only managed five years in the minor leagues when I got the big league job. And, of course, the media writes that I wasn't ready, maybe I wasn't prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to say that I wasn't because I felt like that, that I was per perfectly capable of doing the job. And even thinking today, you know, I question myself sometimes, was I ready? You know? right. um, but the bottom line is I got to manage in the big leagues. Yeah, which is... It was, a, it was something that, that many 
many managers managing the minor leagues their whole career never get the opportunity that I got as a younger guy. Now, moving back to my question about the substance abuse, Ron Washington in 2009 for the Rangers was caught with cocaine, um, but you know he apologized sincerely and they let him continuing, continue to manage. What do you think about that? Like, what are your thoughts on him being able to continue? Um, I feel like there's a double standard. Well, I, you know, you know what happened there is, is is you know I talk about a lot when people ask me. Mm -hmm. um, I know they did an article for um, MILB not too long ago, and it was brought up, and and it gives me an opportunity to uh, reflect on you know my life at that point in time. Um, you know. What I did from then until 1999 was I scouted a little bit for the Red Sox. Um, I spent a lot of time, I know they asked me to manage the area code team out in Long Beach, the Northeast area code team. Mm -hmm. Wayne Britton asked me to manage that, which were high school players who were gonna be drafted. And I went out and, and it probably, you know, in that stadium, 5,000 prospects. And, you know, it wasn't anything planned. I just walked down to the guy that was doing the talking. I said, let me talk to these kids for a little bit. And I told them my story. Hmm. And I'll never forget that I got home from that. And Wayne Britton, who was the scouting director, called me and said, we want you back in the organization. And we want you to manage uh, our Florida State team. Wow. So I was back. Yeah. It just is. I made a decision after that year when a job opened up in the Atlantic League, which meant I had a young family at home. I could be at home more, um, uh, which, was, which was very important to me. Uh, I won't say that not going, having the chance to maybe go to Double A for the Red Sox, they were in treatment at the time, was an option. Mm -hmm. I, I, I felt like that that's kind of where they wanted me to go. But I made a decision that I felt like I'd be at home with my family more, and I made the decision to go to the Atlantic League. So I did have the opportunity to go back. Right. Baseball is a, a very forgiving game. Yeah. You know, I, I felt like I feel like that that if I politic enough to get back to an organization for what I've done here and the people I've helped here, that I would probably have that opportunity. But I don't. Good Lord wants me back with an organization; He's going to put me there. Right. So he wants me back choice. in the big leagues. I'm 63 days short of 10 years, which is your max year. That's when you max out. The only way I can get that is to go back as a coach or a manager. And, and it, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, then I'm okay with that. Right, you're just kind of letting it be. No, I'm still in the game. I'm yes. still, what we do here is 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 what I learned from, from playing for Bear Bryant. He taught us life after football. Was, we have to teach life after baseball here because the guys are either going to go back to an organization or they're going to go to Taiwan or Japan or somewhere where they can make some money or they're going home. It's over. And... It's a very difficult thing for a professional athlete to accept. I've had three players this year that came in and sat down with tears in their eyes because I got to go home and be with my family. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to how I'm going to respond at home when I don't have this game anymore. Mm -hmm. And you know, They're sometimes it's up to me to say that family is more important than this game, mm -hmm. even though it's part of your life and you're going to still have thoughts about it even while you're at home. Um, you know, so I, I, I kind of like, I, I, I kind of like, I do like being able to um, share my life's experiences in this game, good and bad, right? With my players, yeah. they know. Yeah. Not anything that, that they don't know about me, because you know you're going to read up on what your manager is and what he's done and where he's been. So, um, uh, I like where I am. Um, you know. I pursued the Alabama job. I thought I had a chance to get it, and it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to end my career at the college level, huh. but it didn't work out. So, well, I'm still, so I'm still kicking. I'm still managing. I still got a job, and I'm still involved with baseball. Yeah, that's all that matters, right? Yeah, that's all that matters. On a lighter note, um, you played with Dick Pole, right? I can't uh, help but laugh at that name. Dick Cole. Oh, yeah? And yeah. did you guys, um, did you call him Richard or did you call him Dick? No, I called him Dick. You called him Dick? Yeah, yeah. No, did he get no. a lot of uh, gruff about that in the, the clubhouse? Not too much. Not too yeah, much? Not too much. He was a really, he, he was a, <laughs> Dick was a tremendous clubhouse guy. Okay. He was happy all the time. He was, plus, he was a good pitcher. He was a, he was a very intense competitor on the mound. But he was a very happy guy. And, and he even showed that when he was pitching coach for the Giants for all those years. He's uh, um, one of my favorite people that I've ever been around.
Wow. Well, and he, you know, he survived through a pretty serious, scary when he got hit with a line drive. That yeah. was pretty. That was pretty ugly. Yeah, really. And being a pitcher, mm -hmm. that's something. But uh, yeah, big poles, good people. I like him a lot. Good. Well, thank you for joining me, Hobson, All and right. I really appreciate it.